The Bible is full of giants, and giants uh, really are a picture of obstacles, of difficulties, of strongholds, of resistances that, that God wants us to gain victory over. So um, if you've got your Bibles, could you turn with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Praise God. This is a, a familiar passage. Before we do, let's just pray. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you. Your word is truth, O oh God. And Lord, as we hear your word, O oh God, I pray, Lord, that we'll catch, O oh God. Lord, my God, the glimpses, O oh God, of revelation and truth, O oh God. Lord, that you have, Lord, resident within your word. I pray, Lord, that you'll, Lord, just spark things in our spirit. Lord, my God, you'll give answers. You'll give encouragement. You'll give comfort. You'll give strength, oh God. You'll give direction and wisdom, Lord. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, this is a longish passage, so just bear with me for a wee while. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. And were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. They are camped between Sokoth and Azkah, and Ephraim Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, Israel stood on a mountain on the other, with a valley in between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the coat, uh, and the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had uh, bronze armor on his legs, a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Um, now the staff of his spear was like a, beamer's, uh, a weaver's beam, uh, and his, uh, the uh, iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. A shield-bearer went before him, and then he stood out and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose for yourself a man and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David, the son of the Ephraim of Bethlehem and Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons, and the man was old and advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul into battle. The names of his three sons who went to battle were Elab, the firstborn, next to him at Dinabab, and the, the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest of the three, three oldest, uh, and, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented him uh, 40 days, morning and evening. And Jesse said to his son, to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of dried grain, these ten loaves, and run to your brother at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the camp of their thousands, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Verse 19. Now Saul uh, and they, and all the, uh, all the men of Israel were in Elah, the valley of Elah, fighting the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took things uh, and went and went to, as Jesse has commanded him. And he came to the camp uh, as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array against the army. And David had left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and greeted his brothers. And they talk, and he as he talked with them, there was the champion of the Philistines of Gath. Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. 
And all the men of Israel, when he saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man, this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the, any man that kills, the, uh, kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. He will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men and st who stood by him. He says, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Elab, Eli, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Elab's anger was roused against David, and he said, Why have you come down here? And who is with the sheep, these few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? This, is there not a cause? And then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as they did the first ones did. Now when the words of David were spoken, and spoke, the, days that, the words that David spoke were heard, then they were reported to Saul. And they sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go and fight against the Philistines. Uh, you're just a youth. And he, and, uh, he, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion and a bear came, and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he's defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said to the, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the, ha the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So David, David, Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword uh, to, uh, to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his uh, and sling, his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So when the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked on about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will make your flesh for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and with spear and with javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the God whose armies of Israel you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give your carcass to the of, and the carcass of the camp of the Philistines, the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. Praise God. May God bless us his word this morning. Hallelujah. You know, as I said, we, as we look at the story of David and Goliath, I said, many of us have maybe heard it and uh, preached or in, in, in Sunday school. It's a familiar passage. But it's one of the most amazing stories of courage and faith depicted in the Bible. And within it, there are many life principles which prepare us for the battles of life. Amen. Anybody going through some battles? Anybody know what battles are about? Or struggles, problems, difficulties? You know, those are things that are part and parcel of living in this world that we live in, in this broken world that we live in. And really, you know, in the battle, that's where we make our mark. That's when we really, 
you know, understand and see that God is real. God's grace is sufficient. Amen. And, uh, you know, God wants us to be on the front foot and not the back foot. He wants us to be overcomers, not overcome. Hallelujah. Praise His name. So there's much within this that I believe will be an encouragement to us today. Amen. Praise God. So just a little bit of background here. We see here, uh, as depicted in the scripture, Israel at war with the Philistines, their arch enemies. And, you know, the picture here is uh, of uh, the Valley of Elah. And it's, a, uh, it's in Israel, and I believe northern Israel. And, uh, you know, there's uh, a high ground where the Philistines are. And the Philistines are really in the, the uh, advantage, advantages, uh, advantageous position. And then uh, there's the valley, and then just on a, a lower hill are the, the Israelites. And uh, so on a daily basis, we see the Philistines' strategy was to demoralize, was to discourage, was to defeat Israel before an arrow was fired or anything take place. And so they sent this massive giant Goliath, nine foot monster he was. <laughs> I used to, we used to uh, have in our fellowship uh, the tallest man in Ireland, uh, Sean Esbitt. And Sean is about seven foot two. Uh, but this guy was even bigger than Sean. And uh, so, you know, he was intimidating, he was imposing. And, you know, there was something about him that was just perso evil personified. So out he came, day by day, almost like a, a John Wayne uh, walk. And, uh, you know, he, he would throw shapes. He would intimidate the, the armies of Israel. He stood up and defied the armies of Israel. But he also defied the God of Israel. And what he does is he throws down a gauntlet, a challenge. And he calls for a man to stand up against him. And if that man was able to defeat him, then the, the Philistines would become their, their slaves. But if he defeated the, uh, the, the Israeli champion, then Israel would become their slaves. So he throws down that, and it, for 40 days, every day he comes out and he, he, he just demoralizes them. It's like psychological warfare. Amen. Just to try and soften and, and create fear and create an atmosphere of defeat in the hearts of the Israelites. And so that was the effect. When he comes, it sends Israel into a tailspin. They cower at his intimidation. Fear sends a shudder down their spine. They gulp every time they see him. Their knees turn to jelly. And they're just, you know, in dismay. They're just, you know, withdrawn in themselves. They're discouraged. They're defeated. And, you know, there's a sense of foreboding gloom and doom that sits in negativity, defeatism, hopelessness, despair. And you see, friends, many people in this world today, that's their experience of life. The giants of life come to intimidate, to put them down. To engender fear and discouragement and dismay. And friends, we thank God that he's not given us a spirit of fear. Through Jesus Christ, we have a spirit of love and power and sound mind. Fear does not have to rule us. Fear doesn't have to intimidate us. God has got a plan for us. And that plan is a plan of victory. Praise God. So while all this is going on, Back at the ranch, we find young David, a shepherd boy. Uh, he's called in from the fields by his father. His three brothers have been out in battle, Elab, Shama, and Adinabab. And his father says, no, son, I want you to take some cheese. I want you to take some, some food, some supplements to your brothers who are out fighting the battle. And so David complies, and he goes off, and he takes... Uh, the supplements to the, the, uh, the boys that are out in the, in the battle. Hallelujah. And as he's going, I, I can just imagine what was going on in his mind. Here he is, he's carrying this, the, uh, this, the, uh, the food items that, that his father has given him. 
But as he's going, I'm sure that some things are crossing his mind. As he's going, Holy Spirit is reminding him of things that God has caused him to experience. He's reminding him of the time when the bear, when he wrestled with that bear. He's reminding him of the time when he wrestled with that lion. Hallelujah. So by the time he arrives, he's rejoicing. He's strengthened by you know, those things, those victories that God has already wrought in his life. And I want you to remember that as we, we just continue on in our message this morning. So when David arrives, the Goliath show is in full swing. Intimidation, domination, manipulation, control were the order of the day. And as he comes, even, again, just the, 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 the default uh, response from Israel was they were ducking for cover. Now, that's what we see in the natural. But what I want us to see this morning is what's happening in the spiritual. There was a, a curtain just pulled back, and we begin to peer behind the scenes, beginning to understand that you know, there's, there is a natural realm, but then there is a spiritual realm, hallelujah, behind it all. And what we see here is, is that there's, this is a war of words. As I said earlier, not a shot had been fired at this point in the game, yet Israel were already defeated. See, the enemy's job was already done, or half done, hallelujah, by making Israel believe that they were defeated. Now, friends, many a time you're facing a giant. Many times you're facing a problem, a situation, a difficulty, and if the enemy can begin by sowing in you seeds of doubt and fear and unbelief, he has a, you're a pushover. The job is already done. And so that's a spiritual thing, amen? And so, you know, what we've got to understand is, is that what this demonstrates really is the power there is in words. You know, the name Goliath means to revile. It means he who verbally assaults, who advertises in a disgraceful sense to boast or to gossip or to slander. So this boy, you can imagine what he was like growing up. Come here, slanderer. Come here, accuser. Come here, foul mouth. Come here, you who verbally assaults. That's what his name meant. And that's what he was. He was a big mouth. He was somebody who, you know, you didn't want to be around. You know, it was interesting. We had a, a young a man, it was a young man, an older man actually, coming in on, on Friday night, just came in off the street, drawn by the Holy Spirit. He came up here. And he says to me, he says, Pastor, you've got a, a job on your hands. He says, that's what he said to me. He says, because I'm pure evil. I'm pure evil. That was the confession of his mouth. You know, what we say often reflects what we believe. And that's what he believed. And I'm sure, you know, he, he didn't, we didn't go all the history. But I know that, you know, He's had a, a tough life. I know he's had some, some, some ups and downs and some, some places he shouldn't have been. But you know something? He was here by the Spirit. And God had a purpose in mind and he wanted to change that circumstance and turn that situation around. Hallelujah. So Goliath's name means to revile, to verbally assault. There's power in words. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says this. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You see, what we say is important. We have the ability to speak life or death through our words, blessing or cursing. We can persuade men positively or negatively. 
You see, what we're going to understand is words are like a seed, like a capsule. Within that word is contained the emotion, the thoughts of our human spirit. But also within that word is the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And you see, when we're speaking words of truth, when we're speaking words of life, we're sowing seed that's going to produce fruit, that's going to change and turn situations around. Hallelujah. In Goliath's case, what was wrapped up in his words were his emotion, were his thoughts, but the spirit was demonic. Fear, intimidation, control, despair, destruction. Those were the spirits behind the words that uh, Goliath was speaking. Now, the book of James says a lot about the tongue, the power of the tongue. I'm going to read this very quickly here this morning. Praise God. James 3, verses 1 to 13. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall all lead, uh, shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in a word, he is a perfect man, and able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and they turn the whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are large, they're driven by fierce winds, and they turn by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See how great a forest fire, uh, sorry, great forest a little fi uh, fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, world of iniquity. The tongue is so set in our members that it defiles the whole body, sets it on fire for the course of nature, and sets it on fire by hell. For every beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no, one, no, but no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings, I brethren, these things should not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Thus no, it's, it's, uh, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise among you? Let him show by his good conduct that his, that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. Hallelujah. So Paul is speaking here to... Uh, to Timothy, amen, uh, and he's telling me about the power of the tongue, and what he's saying, this basic, is, is the tongue is small, it's seeming inconsequential, but it's like the rudder of a ship, or like a fire that determines, that can determine life. The I do's determine your direction. Inner vows, people saying, uh, I'll never trust again. Those things are spoken, and they determine the course of our destiny. And so those things are very, very important. And he goes on and says, who can tame the tongue? With man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. So I just want to list just some, some very quickly just some, some things to help us with our tongues, with what we say. Firstly, we tame the tongue by dedicating our hearts and our tongue to the Lord daily. Psalm 19, verse 1. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Secondly, we put our hearts in tune with God's Spirit by reading His Word. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hidden my, 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 my heart that I might not sin against you. Thirdly, we need to assume responsibility for every word we speak. In uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, it tells, But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account of on the day of judgment. For, uh, fourthly, we need to learn to speak words that encourage, comfort, inspire, and edify. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Let your speech be always seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Friends, 
We need to learn to speak words of encouragement, words of grace, hallelujah, words of love, words of truth. Amen. People don't need to know how bad they are. They already know that. Every one of us knows the struggles we're facing, the areas that we're weak in. And we don't need another person coming on top of us, laying another layer. Amen. We need to lift one another up. So you, you'll change through encouragement. Hallelujah. You give somebody a, you lift them up out of the pit. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We need to ask forgiveness for any unloving words or attitudes. Amen. We need to commit ourselves to giving a good report when necessary. Amen. In all situations. Amen. Again, the, the default with so many people is to look on the negative. And when you are in a climate of negativity, when there is you know, negative speaking and negative attitudes, and you come into that, you know, it's very hard to remain buoyant. Amen? So those are things that we need God to ask God's grace for to help us with. Amen? Hallelujah. It's important what we listen to and what we say, and who we listen to. Amen? Praise God. So that's the power of words. And Goliath understood the power of words. He knew that, as I said, he would defeat Israel if he got them to believe the words that he was speaking. So now, as you look through this passage, you can split it into two. First part of the passage is, it begins with, and the Philistine and the Philistine. And then halfway through, we find, and David. And David. And David. You see, what you have in the beginning of that chapter, you have the Philistines. You have Goliath setting the agenda. And the big question you ask in this passage is who's setting the agenda? Is the world setting the agenda? Is your giant setting your agenda? Is what you've been told setting the agenda? Or is God setting the agenda? Hallelujah. And so this begins to turn. There's a turning point. When David shows up, when the young shepherd boy, the forgotten one in the backfields of the, of the, of the, of the, 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 the desert, amen, comes, hallelujah, he begins to change the situation around and so we've got to look at just the life of David. What was it about David that caused him to have such an impact when all of Israel, all the armies of Israel, all the strong men of Israel, the king of Israel, were completely imploded, ready to throw in the towel, ready to surrender to, the, to Goliath? What was it about David? I want to list a couple of things here tonight, today uh, as, we, as we close. First thing was David had a strong prayer and devotional life. See, David's victory had already been assured before he arrived on the scene. Amen. And it, it had been assured by his pattern, his lifestyle of prayer, of praise, and meditation in the Word of God. Hallelujah. And we see that throughout the Bible. When you look at the book of Psalms, so many of the Psalms were written by David. And when you look at the Psalms, you realize that, you know, he's not always painting a pretty picture. Some of the Psalms, he's in the depths of depression. Some of the Psalms, you know, he's, he's ready to, to tear his hair out. And he's very honest in his emotions in the, uh, in the Psalms. He pours out his heart to the Lord. He pours out his feelings. He pours out his burdens to the Lord. But as he begins to do that, as he unburdens himself, as he brings and he casts his care upon the Lord, then you find in the, the psalm, but yet I will trust in the Lord my God. I will look to the Lord. He is my help. My salvation comes from him. That's the pattern we find with David, amen? 
David was no different than any, any other human being on the face of the planet. But he responded to life's battles in a different kind of way. Hallelujah. He practiced the presence of God. And friends, I want to again just challenge us this morning, encourage us to begin to practice the presence of the Lord, to take seriously the Word of God, to spend time in prayer and in praise, thanking Him for His goodness, thanking Him for His blessings. Hallelujah. Praise His name. You know, there was a man by the name of Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence was a, he wasn't an academic, but he was a, a servant of God. And one of the things that Brother Lawrence would do and would be he, he would just serve and he would just wash dishes. Do something incredibly simple, incredibly menial. But he'd do that to the glory of God. And you know the impact of Brother Lawrence was this. People would come, they would travel miles to come and watch him wash dishes. There was the glory of God on his face. People would come and they'd experience the presence of God when they walked into that kitchen because he was practicing the presence of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise his name. Hallelujah. 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 So David had a different kind of prayer life and devotional life to uh, many of the others. Amen. And that prepared him for the battle. It was the, the foundation, if you like, for the battle. And so when David, this young man, arrives, this wasn't just youthful bravado. God had been doing something within him. Amen. Hallelujah. There were practical experiences that God had allowed him to come through. Hallelujah. That provided a platform of preparation. The second thing was David's perspective was different. He saw things differently to his brothers. He saw things differently to Saul. He saw things differently to all the other soldiers. Hallelujah. See, and I want you to get this. This is the, the heart of what I want to say to you today. David defeated Goliath not because of how he fought, Defeated the Goliath because of the way he thought. It was how he thought that defeated Goliath. David was a great thinker. He thought like God. He had the mind of God. Hallelujah. I want to look just very briefly four elements of great thinking. The first thing was David was a faith thinker. The others were a fear thinkers. And there's a difference, amen? See, David's focus was Godward. He was focused on God. He was focused on, you know, the rewards. When he came and he saw the Philistine, he asked, he says, what should be done for the man who kills this, uh, this Philistine? Well, he's going to get uh, the, daughter, the king's daughter's hand in marriage, and the family's going to be uh, tax-free. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> and that deal was on the table, but not one of those Israeli soldiers picked it up. Only the shepherd boy. Hallelujah. Three times he asked the question, so his focus was, God, God, you're able. God, you're able. You're bigger than this giant. Amen? You're bigger than this problem. And he realized, not only will God, uh, is God able to do it, but there's an advantage. Amen? There's a reward. Hallelujah. And it reminds me, of, you know, just uh, a number of centuries earlier, there was a, a similar situation with giants there in Numbers 13. And you remember the, 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 the picture there. What had happened was Israel, 400 years in slavery in Egypt. God raises up Moses, a powerful deliverer, 
mighty signs and wonders. Hallelujah. And then the Red Sea splits. And the population of Ireland cross from one side to the other. Amen. And they come to the promised land, the place, the destination that God had for his people. And so Moses sends in the, the 12 spies. Ten go in and say, look, it's a great spot. Land flowing with milk and honey. Yes, everything that you said it would be is true. But it's difficult. But there's giants. But there's problems. And we can't do it because of the problem. We can't do it because of the difficulty. We can't do it because it's too hard. And then they spread it out. It can't be done. It's impossible. We're going to be defeated. We're going to be slaughtered. And that effect goes through the camp. Just like Goliath's effect upon Israel. Fear, unbelief, doubt, weakness of will, discouragement set in. But two men stood up and said, no, our God is surely able. Joshua and Caleb. The Bible says they were men of a different spirit and that they worshiped the Lord wholly. Praise God. See, that's the effect of words. That's the effect of reports. It goes into your spirit. It weakens us. Sometimes what we listen to on the TV or look at it on the internet, or read on books, or hear in our conversations, have the same effect upon us. They suck the faith out of us. They suck the life out of us. And we've got to be careful what we listen to. Amen. You see, what was an operation in Numbers chapter 13 was what I call negative faith. Negative faith. The definition of negative faith is this. It's more faith in the problem than in the God who is the solution. And friends, I believe God is by His Spirit is wanting to demolish some patterns of thinking, some default ways that we operate with when we engage with problems. Our first default is to look to the negative. Our first default is to think it can't be done. Woe is me. It's impossible. I'm lost. I'm undone. No. No, no, no. Your God is able. Your God is able. Your God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you can think or even believe. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise His name. See, we have to have a real understanding of faith. David had that. See, Saul saw Goliath as too big to hit. David saw Goliath as too big to miss. Amen. And that's how we've got to look at our problems. Sometimes problems come our way, and they're God's opportunities to see the display of his miraculous provision, to do something within us to strengthen character and life within us, to perform, to, to form the life of Christ within us. Hallelujah. Praise his name. So we have to learn to become not problem, to move from problem-focused thinking to God-focused thinking. Hallelujah. You know, just in the last week or so, I've been just looking at some areas of study, and I came across a, I don't know if I was sharing this with people the other day. I don't know. I can't remember. I was sharing it with somebody. <laughs> and uh, when I was first got saved, um, there was uh, our youth leaders, or, uh, Hamish and Di DeVette. And Hamish was, uh, uh, he was the New Zealand surf champion. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he ended up going into ministry, into pastoring. And uh, his wife was a teacher. And she went into, into counseling. And uh, her vision was to, uh, to take biblical understanding, 
biblical truth and apply it in the field of counseling. And so she pioneered something quite revolutionary in New Zealand. She went through the secular university. She was in Auckland University. She qualified with her PhD. But what she brought was a, a Christian, Christ-centered counseling model. Amen. So I was just, just looking at some of her material. And uh, she was three basic pro points that she was making. One was, it was, some of them three words, locate, encounter, and develop. Locate, encounter, develop. And what that first, the word, first thing to locate was to find God. Find what she described as the God space. Hallelujah. And what that means is coming to the place where you are seated together with Him in heavenly places. Where you're in His presence. You see, when you've got the problem, you're not going to find your solution at the bottom of the pit. You're not going to find your solution in the quagmire of problems and difficulties. The more you focus at the problem, the bigger the problem's going to get. You're not, there's no answer there. There's no answer looking you know, through all the, the past hurts and problems and situations of your life. The only purpose in that is to, to bring that and present that before the Lord so He can deal with it. But if you live there, you're stuck in the mire. You're stuck where the devil wants you to go. But if we begin to find ourselves located in God's presence, in His presence, there's fullness of joy. In His presence, there's life. In His presence, there's healing. There's deliverance, there's revelation, there's truth, there's transformation. So we've got to find that God space. And for each of us, that's different. Now, it's, let me just be very clear. I'm not just here. Jesus is the door. But for some of us, it's in worship. For others, it might be sitting quietly in your bedroom with the, your Bible in front of you. For others, it may be in a mountain place. For some, it works in different ways, but we've got to find the presence of God. I was just thinking, forget finding Nino. <laughs> huh? Or Darius. <laughs> we need to find God. We need to be found in His presence. Amen? In His presence... Then we encounter him, encounter his grace, encounter his love, encounter his truth. And then we develop the strategy that God gives us, amen, that leads us out of the pit, amen. Praise God. So David was a, a faith thinker, amen. He saw God bigger than the problem. And when he faced the giant, he found himself reminded of his past victories and successes, he drew from those what he learned from them, and he applied them now to his new challenge. Amen. Verse 37 says, The God who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the land of this hand of the, the Philistine. Amen. So the victories that he had way back then, he learned things through that. Amen. He learned that God was able. He learned that God was his protector, that he was his deliverer, that he was his victor. And so when he faced the giant, he took what he had learned and applied it to this new situation. And see, friends, we've got to learn from what God has done. Many of you, all of you, at one point or time, God has, you've met with God in a real way, in a tangible way. And God has, has done things in your life. And there are principles that you learn and God has taught you through that that aren't just there to be a trophy on the shelf, but they're to be a tool, a sword, a hammer to deal with the situation you're facing with right now. Hallelujah. So he was a God, he was a, a faith thinker. Secondly, he was a fourth dimensional thinker. He thought beyond merely the material, visible realm, but regarded the reality of the invisible. 
You see, he knew what was going on behind the scenes. He realized that, you know, this wasn't just an ordinary battle. This wasn't just a physical, natural, material, three-dimensional world that he was dealing with. There is a spirit world behind the material world. There's an invisible before the, the visible. Amen? Hallelujah. He said in verse 26, he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This wasn't, he wasn't just defying Israel. He was defying the living God. Hallelujah. See, Saul saw him defying the armies of Israel. David saw Goliath defying the armies of God. Verse 45, he says to Goliath, you come against me with sword and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the God Almighty, whose armies you've defied, defiled. <laughs> so he understood that this was, this was spiritual before it was natural. Hallelujah. So he was a faith thinker. He thought in the fourth in four dimensions, spiritually, hallelujah. Thirdly, he thought he had fresh thinking. See, conventional thinking wasn't working. He needed a fresh approach. He was unwilling to put his trust in man's methods. And we see that just through, you know, taking on Saul's armor. He refused to take on Saul's armor. He needed to take, to be who he was. And to apply, you know, principles that fitted who he was. Amen. You see, sometimes, friends, we get in, in this, this sort of trap. It's almost like the, the hamster in the wheel. And just the cycle that we're in. And we're doing the same old things, the same old way, and expecting change. But only change comes when you do things differently. So you always get angry. Is it working? You always withdraw. Is it working? You always back off. You always give up. Is that working for you? Friends, we've got to do things differently. Amen. And I believe that's what God is wanting in this, this day and this age. Church, we can do the same old things the same old way and expect God to do something. So when he's saying, guys, I want you to do it different. I want you to do it different. And when we respond, amen, I want to put new wine in a new wine skin, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And we've got to be flexible enough to be able to do that. And the final thing I'll say tonight, today, is he thought forcefully. See, David was willing to stand out from the crowd. He overcame the ridicule of his brother Elab. His brother Elab began to just judge his motives. He says, I know what you're, you're all about. I know your pride. You know, and sometimes when you're wanting to do the things of God, and you're wanting to change, and you're wanting to, 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 to deal with the, 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 the giants in your life, you'll get brothers who come alongside you and, and discourage you. And you've got to be forceful enough, independent enough, and say, no. My God is able. My God has talked to me. My God has called me for such a time as this. My God has got something better for me. He overcame his brother's ridicule. He overcame Saul's dismissal. Saul says, you can't do it. You're too young. He says, my God is able. And he overcame Goliath's taunts and his intimidation. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We're going to finish here. God is able. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I just, I just want to read one more scripture and we'll close. 1 John 5. 
verse 4. It says this. This is what God says to you this morning. Everyone who's born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except he who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe who, who, the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Hallelujah. You're born again to win. Amen. Amen. You're born again to overcome. You're Goliath, you're giants. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Kuraba Vasinda Rebashidia. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, that you would impart to us, Lord, today just a fresh sense of boldness. Lord, you've said, Lord, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to cower under intimidation. That we don't have to, Lord, allow the giants of this world, oh God, to set our agenda. You have a different agenda for us, oh God. An agenda, Lord, of blessing, of prosperity, Lord, of victory, oh God. And Father God, I pray, like Caleb and Joshua, make us men and women of a different spirit. Oh, my God, my God, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, destroy, Lord, every giant. Use us, oh God, in our unique ways, oh God, in our unique shapes and understandings and who we are, oh God. Lord, to be giant slayers, in Jesus' precious name, amen, amen, amen. amen. praise God, God bless you.